we go behind the velvet ropes. And so this is 20s era China. So during the time of Downton, this is what the Vanderbilts would have been eating on. For a little upstairs downstairs comparison between the Biltmore Estate and the PBS masterpiece series Downton Abbey. It's amazing how many storylines on Downton you actually see here too. Just a lot of the personal struggles. This is my floor. I come in here. I need to vacuum the pool table. Come along as we explore Biltmore, our Downton. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, I'm Heather Burgess at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville for a very special look at the comparisons between the Biltmore and Downton Abbey. We are told not a day goes by when a guest doesn't walk through the door and proclaim how much this reminds them of their favorite masterpiece series, Downton Abbey. And there's good reason for that. From the staff to the Vanderbilt family, the style and the time period, it's all there. And even the staff, the modern day Mr. Carsons and Daisies, rise early to make sure the house is ready and perfect to greet their guests. From the very first moment when, you, when we first go into Downton Abbey and we see the house and they're opening up and you see the servants opening the house and getting the fires ready and opening the blinds, it's very much like Biltmore was and it's very much like how Biltmore is today. My name is Dina Gasperson. Uh, I'm in housekeeping. I try to get here maybe about 15 to 6, so I don't have me a sip of coffee. We start cleaning from the top all the way to the bottom, and everything in the room is clean spotless before we leave. We dusted yesterday, so this is uh, half a day and nighttime dust from where the guests come in at nighttime from candlelight. And the first floor gets very dusty. We'll brush. See the dust coming up with the flashlight? You kind of have a plan of attack for the cleaning every day. Do you kind of know what, where you're going and what you're doing? Yeah, I have, I have a plan because, um, see, the uh, first floor is so big anyway, which all the floors are big. We've got quite a lot to do. I've got special brushes that I use. Okay. Take a look at one of these books. Okay. Our manager here, he likes to come through with his flashlight and he checks us to make sure we don't leave any dust, and that helps us too. And he, he lets us know if we've missed something. So what's the story on the banquet hall chairs? Okay, I went in yesterday morning. I'm Jared Palmer, the Biltmore House housekeeping manager, and uh, my role here is to preserve Biltmore House and its collections, the horse hair brush on it. I did. They are wonderful staff. They are expertly trained. We rely on them heavily um, because they are the eyes and ears of the collection. They are intimately involved with the collections and they uh, let us know when something's wrong. I'm Molly Reed and I'm a floral designer at the Biltmore Estate. Um, every morning when I get here, I fill up my watering cart and I water and groom all of the plants and flower arrangements inside Biltmore House. It really is like a family here. Um, there are a lot of people that have been here 10, 20, 30 years. Um, there are a lot of families that work here. So what is it like to be here in the morning, getting this house ready for the board guests? Um, there's a little bit of excitement in the air and um, you know, it's quiet and peaceful, kind of like a calm before the storm. <laughs> but we like to make things perfect for the guests, so it's a very enjoyable experience for everyone. There's not another job on the planet like this, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I love my job. <laughs> Biltmore is America's largest home, but for fans of the PBS masterpiece series Downton Abbey, the Biltmore estate is a close reality to the fictional Crawley family and the lives of their staff portrayed on the show. Something we've been trying to do for the last several years is to make this grand house seem livable, to show that this was a house and a home 
that was used by the Vanderbilts. And I think Downton Abbey has uh, helps us imagine what life was like at Biltmore House. From the time period, the furnishings, the elaborate meals, and even the horses, many of the daily activities seen on screen are very similar to the real lives of George, Edith, and their daughter, Cornelia Vanderbilt. When you're watching uh, the Crawley family on Downton Abbey, you know, you're seeing how they went through their day. And it, it could be everything from, you know, garden walks or hunting parties or, you know, uh, going off of the estate, and then of course, uh, fine dining in the evenings. And then you're also seeing what's happening downstairs too. People I think are more and more interested in this time period and really interested in the interrelationships between staff and family. And so that has certainly been very fun. You know, people want to learn more about the people who worked here and the people who lived here. They're really curious about the Vanderbilts. You may remember in Downton Abbey, the series kicks off in 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic. Biltmore also has a chilling connection to that tragedy. George, Edith, and Cornelia Vanderbilt were all booked to, um, um, to go on the maiden voyage of Titanic. And at the very last minute, they, cho they chose to go to the sister ship, uh, Olympic. And I guess it ended up being a pretty good decision. Of course, Biltmore, constructed in 1895, is much newer than Downton Abbey is portrayed, but much of the same style is used throughout the home. You're seeing you know, a portrayal of an English country house, and though Biltmore has a very French facade, the interior runs very much like an English country house. I think George was very inspired when he made Biltmore. And so you see these rooms that have historical furniture, um, but yet are comfortable and used, and that's something that's certainly true here. There's a, a library and a, and a dining hall and a, a drawing room all on Downton Abbey. We have those same types of rooms that were, had the same purpose, uh, you know, here at Biltmore. We have, you know, a very fine painting collection, a tapestry collection. Each room is decorated in a different style or period, and uh, you see the same thing. Uh, you know, it's kind of in the background at Downton, so you have to kind of look past, you know, the plot lines and what's happening. As for servants, many of the same protocols were in place, but in America, the housekeeper ran the home, not the butler. Sorry, Mr. Carson. The difference is that um, here at Biltmore and in a lot of American homes, the head housekeeper actually was the highest ranking servant. And from what we know, uh, Mrs. Mrs. King ran the house and then the head butler was under her, but he supervised a lot of the male staff. Just as seen on Downton, there is a call system to ring for service. But at Biltmore, George Vanderbilt had installed an electric state-of-the-art call system. No bells here, just lights to show the servants which room or area of the home needed attention. We know that from the technology of the house, that the, the main call system, uh, the telephones, everything. And you know that the, the housekeeper and the head butler were running things from the butler's pantry, so that is a difference. A dinner uh, was a grand affair, you know, full dress at 8 o'clock, um, you know, white tie as you see on Downton Abbey, and we do know that also occurred, that's the way it occurred here at Biltmore. You can only imagine the dinner dresses at Biltmore, jewelry sparkling in the candlelight at dinner time, just fantastic, and I think you see a lot of that happening on Downton Abbey. The dinners were a grand, uh, elaborate meals, typically somewhere around seven courses. They had professional chefs that worked in the kitchens. Being able to um, showcase the talents of your chef was considered um, you know, part of running a grand home like this. The way they portray uh, how busy it was in the kitchens, I think that is quite accurate from what we know and uh, from our research. And house guests were a large part of the fabric of Biltmore life, just as we see on almost every episode of Downton Abbey. There were large house parties, there were also small house parties, and so you would have Edith uh, Vanderbilt's sister visiting by herself. We do know that the Vanderbilts uh, had a lot of friends in the, in the art community, so a lot of artists or authors would visit. Uh, we know that Edith Wharton came a couple of times, as well as Henry James. On Downton, we see Lady Mary's son George and cousin Sibby's life as infants at the English estate. Cornelia Vanderbilt herself was born in this room at the Biltmore and also had nannies to watch over her frequent childhood romps. She certainly would have had a very unique childhood growing up. She was the only 
child of the Vanderbilts. This was really her home and her castle to grow up in. You can often hear visitors to Biltmore ask about the similarities to Downton Abbey, one of them being Cornelia Vanderbilt's lavish wedding in 1924. Just like Lady Mary, Cornelia Vanderbilt's wedding attracted attention far and wide. Cornelia was married in 1924, and she was also married to um, marrying into the English nobility. Her husband was of aristocratic birth. We know from photographs that there was a huge crowd that had formed in Biltmore Village, and they were wanting to see who was coming to this wedding. Just as the fictional Crawley family has had to deal with financial setbacks and keeping up the manner of their estate, the same could be said about Biltmore. Throughout the years, the Vanderbilts had to think creatively to keep the Biltmore estate viable and sustainable for the future. George Vanderbilt dying uh, at an early age and uh, Edith Vanderbilt having to try to you know, pick up the pieces and to maintain this grand estate. And certainly when estate taxes came into play, income taxes, they really had to do a lot of planning in order to make sure that the estate was able to persevere and, and to be maintained. George Vanderbilt was a visionary in that way from the very beginning and he planned for the estate to be self-supporting and that included multiple farming operations. Biltmore Estate curators say they feel each new episode of Downton Abbey in some vivid ways brings to life the upstairs and downstairs history of Biltmore. And I think Downton Abbey helps us imagine, even though it's a fictional drama, um, that you, know, you can see what's, what's happening in, in a similar type home and really understand you know, how people lived at that particular time. The holidays at Biltmore have always been a beautiful and exciting time, and we see that as well in Downton Abbey. The Vanderbilt and the Cecil families both loved to throw lavish parties that were both fun and fashionable for the times. And so we enter the banquet hall, a central focus of the holidays for the Vanderbilts. And we see that on Downton as they enter their banquet Certainly, hall. certainly. What went on here during Christmas time and the holidays? So from the very beginning, they decorated, not probably quite this lavishly, really our, our decor is inspired by the Gilded Age, um, but they had this uh, phenomenal tree from the very beginning. So a 30-foot tree, that was really the centerpiece. So in 1895, when, when Biltmore first opened, George was a bachelor, so he didn't have a wife to host us, and so his mother um, filled that role, and they handed out gifts to the children. Mountain children didn't have access to fruit on a regular basis, and so oranges and apples were a great treat, so each child got that. And the oral histories that we have from the very beginning all the way up until the 50s talk about how Christmas was such a special time at Biltmore, how it was such a wonderful tradition, how many how warm it was to come together with their family and to receive these fun gifts from the Vanderbilts. One of my favorite stories, um, a woman who is, who is quite elderly was sharing her memories of growing up on the estate and she talked about coming to the Christmas party and Mrs. Vanderbilt gave her paper dolls and her name was Eugenia Halliburton and Eugenia did not care for her paper dolls and instead of just keeping that to herself she was comfortable enough with Mrs. Vanderbilt and, and told her that she, she didn't really like her paper dolls and instead of being horrified you know Mrs. Vanderbilt was completely gracious and she said well Eugenia what would you like and she looked at the trees and she um, said I love those glass balls and instead of just taking one and giving it to her uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt called Donahue who was the butler and they stripped all of the glass balls off of the trees and gave it to all of the children and then from that point on whenever Mrs. Vanderbilt traveled which was a significant period of time um, she would bring back glass balls for Eugenia by the time that she was older had an entire tree full of balls and then her cat climbed it and knocked down the tree and broke all of the glass balls. Oh my goodness. We're standing in the butler's pantry. What would have been happening? What kind of hustle and bustle would have been going on this, for a dinner party? This would have been grand hustle and bustle. So this is really the butler's domain. This is where our Carson would be. Food would be coming up from the kitchens down below, being plated here on this table. Everything would be ready to go. And then our Carson um, would just have everything under control, have the next course ready to go out when the Vanderbilts were finished, have everything running like clockwork. 
we see in the butler's pantry the beautiful Vanderbilt china. And this is really um, representative of the time period. In the 20s when the house became his daughter Cornelia's. But what she ended up doing is using her own monogram on a design very similar to her father's. So instead of the GWV that you see on George's, you see CSV on Cornelia's. And so this is 20s era china. So during the time of Downton, this is what the Vanderbilts would have been eating on. Alistair Bruce is the historical advisor on Downton Abbey, and when he came to visit, he talked about how nannies would put knives on the back of the chairs to make sure children sat up straight. Was it that ex extreme here at Biltmore? Cornelia certainly grew up with proper etiquette, and we know she had really upright carriage, um, was very elegant, spoke very well, um, and certainly had, had learned all the appropriate lessons, but I don't think she had knives on the back of the chairs. I think things were a little bit more loose at Biltmore. It's a modern, modern house. People see the outside and they think, oh, it's, it's like a, um, an old English castle or an old French castle. But on the inside of the house, it is, was state-of-the-art American technology, everything that you really could have wished for. Um, certainly a lot of things that we have here that they didn't have it down, even though the time periods are similar. Here we have a dumbwaiter. Um, so we have two actually, one that is electric and one that is hand powered. Um, this one actually goes up all the way to right outside of Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom um, and goes down to the kitchen. So as we're in the butler's pantry now, but we're just above the kitchen. So as um, our Mrs. Patmore would have been finishing the meal, um, our Daisy basically would have been bringing things, loading it and sending it up to the butler here. Um, I had a telephone system as well. And so for 1895, this was completely modern, completely state-of-the-art. This is a footman um, who worked at Biltmore. We, he was completely off of our radar. He wasn't on our census records. We didn't know that he was here. And then one of my colleagues, Lenore Harden, was cataloging this item. We keep everything in the collection very organized. Everything has a number. Everything has its place. She was cataloging it and noticed a tag that had an, um, an S. Patrick and Mrs. Vanderbilt, 1921. And so we realized that this was an, a name, um, went into our archives, started digging around, found the story of this gentleman who worked at Biltmore, and we actually tracked him back. He came from England, he was trained as a footman, trained in service, actually worked in New York for a while, worked at George Vanderbilt's sister's home. We found him in the census for 1920 there, and then he came here in 1921. Unfortunately, he contracted tuberculosis, which was very prevalent at that time period, really fought it. And we have letters back and forth that are really touching because it's really chronicles his period of illness and his hope for coming back to work and how much he liked to work here. Um, it tracks how good the Vanderbilts were to him. They were sending him checks every month and paying for his care. Um, he was cared for in Asheville. It was actually a center for tuberculosis care and he really fought the disease for a long time. And unfortunately, our research ultimately led us to, Mex to New Mexico where he passed away in 1928. But he kept this bond with Biltmore through the entire time and was always helping, hoping to come back. In fact, we have correspondence between um, the estate manager and he talking about how Mrs. Vanderbilt has offered him a position gardening at her new home um, when he's all recovered. So it's a sweet story, but a very sad one. And as we enter Biltmore, the visitors see the Winter Garden, a beautiful greeting for everyone who comes here. Talk a little bit about it. It's such a welcoming space. So it was designed by Richard Morris Hunt, the architect, to really bring the outside in, um, just to fill the home with light. There was a fountain at its heart, um, which really brought it to life in so many ways by a really amazing Austrian sculptor. Um, and, and this was one of the first things to come into place um, as they were getting ready for the first opening. Of, so it was really always a welcome. So as they were getting ready for the first party, um, Christmas of 1895, this sculpture was put into place and everything prepared for his guests. And then in the 20s, they had a lot of parties here, including Cornelia had her coming out party when she turned 21, amazing costume party just over the top. And then for her wedding in 1924, they had the wedding breakfast surrounding this area and the table was set up in this space. Now we're entering the Halloween room, which is really not made for Halloween. It was more of a New Year's room for 1925. It was. Tell me a little bit about the paintings that we're seeing. So there are murals all around us. Some of them are scenes out of Russian folk stories. Um, but we got the name because of the, there are 
cats and bats and witches and some spooky characters. Um, but really they are drawn from a Russian cabaret that was popular in the 1920s. And then John and Cornelia saw it, really enjoyed it, and kind of recreated it down here in North Carolina, I've recreated it and built more. So I see over here we see bats and we see kind of the witches. So I can see why people started to call it the Halloween sure, room. Sure. But they're all actually scenes from this cabaret. We, in our music collection, we have the um, piano rolls from the player pianos that then they would have used to entertain people, had the music going, I'm sure had the wine flowing, I would imagine, even though it's prohibition. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and just really turned this entire space into a party space. That's fantastic. And one thing I love is that there is that um, parallel with Downton with 1925, 1925, which is our last year that we're, we're seeing. And there's parties and there's fun. And that is what it was all about. The grandeur. So do, is, is, is that what it makes it so fun to oh, kind of uncover all this? It makes it so fun. It makes it fun to see in the show what they're wearing, to imagine that happening in these spaces, the sort of pre-planning and what the staff is doing, the hustle and bustle down below, below stairs, and the preparations that are happening up in the bedrooms, the dressing, the sort of intrigue, romantic mm -hmm. intrigue. All of that was happening at the house parties at Biltmore. So it's so fun to see it on screen at Downton. The beautiful costumes of Downton Abbey do so much to tell the story in each episode, and those same costumes pass through right here at the Biltmore. We take a look back to see the enthusiasm that was created when they were here. You might say there are some new house guests at the Biltmore estate, and they are dressed to impress. It really brings this period of time to life, to have the costumes in the house, to get a sense of what people would have been wearing when they're visiting. Biltmore, um, it's just, it puts everything together. One of the busiest times at Biltmore was Cornelia's 1924 wedding. And this is the time period that Downton is now in, um, in the middle of. And one of the times that we had the most guests come was for her wedding. So to have them all here, have it be around 1924, it's pretty exciting. From lavish gowns to servants attire and exquisite everyday tweeds and fine fabrics, the exhibit dressing Downton changing fashion for changing times features the elaborate costumes worn by the characters of Downton Abbey. One of the most fun parts of this project was selecting where all of these guests would be going. Um, we were really able to imagine, imagine the characters, where we would have them staying in the house, what would be appropriate, um, what would look good in the rooms. The costumes are wonderful and I think uh, the costume designers that uh, work, work with Downton Abbey have done a great job to uh, make them historically accurate. But then <clears throat> um, we have um, a lady here, curator Nancy Lawson, who has been dressing the mannequins, putting the costumes on mannequins. And she has done an incredible job of bringing the costumes to life uh, to the instance where you can actually imagine the actors in in the costumes, such as Violet, uh, the Dowager Countess, with her cane, and it, it's almost like she's there. One look at the frocks, and you feel the characters of Downton coming to life throughout the Biltmore House, whether it's the village flower show, or maybe the Dowager's judging stance, an ever-timely comedic comment. It's great that we have the accessories, such as the cane, which you can, you can almost imagine Maggie Smith, you know, scornfully looking at some family member. And of course we have uh, Lord Grantham in his linen day suit, which I think both of those can be seen in several scenes. The award-winning costumes are inspired by the changing philosophies and attitudes of the times. I think one of the most fascinating things that we're seeing in the costumes is this change, the social change. So you see the hymns raise, you see the difference between Violet's costumes, which are a little more traditional, have a little bit more of the form um, from that time period, from the 1890s, just sort of a throwback in a way. And then you see these really modern silhouettes that the Grantham girls are wearing. It's just a real range and it's exciting to see. As they prepare the exhibit, the Biltmore Museum Services team marvels at the attention to detail in each costume. We knew the costumes that were coming, but to see them in person and to see the details and the embroidery, the the beadwork, and of course they're a combination of vintage pieces, vintage costumes, or, or costumes with new fabrics, with, but with vintage pieces. And to see them in person is just, it's completely different. 
And Lady Sybil's maternity gown glows with a beautiful style that features antique beading, but new material. There's beaded embellishment, there's this really detailed ribbon work, things that you wouldn't even expect, things that we didn't even really get to glimpse on screen. Um, a lot of detail at the necklines, hemlines. And maybe you remember the coat worn by Cora's mom, Martha Levinson, played by the actress Shirley MacLaine, in this guest room at Biltmore, the fashion looks right at home. And throughout the exhibit, the Downton Abbey costumes speak to visitors as they can better imagine the real lives of the Vanderbilts and how their family and staff lived, worked, and played at the Biltmore. It gives us an opportunity to really explore deeper how, you know, how life was like at Biltmore. Thank you for joining us for a look at Biltmore R. Downton. We'd also like to say thank you to the Biltmore staff and the Biltmore Museum Services team for their expertise in helping us with this show. And thank you for watching.